Praise God. All right. I'm going to go through Mishpatim. Since you are lawyers, well, actually, better probably start earlier. Mishpatim is a part of Shemot. And if we're looking at what we're reading here, we're at the end of the second section of the book. The first section dealt with the freeing of Israel from Egypt. And the second section is dealing with the uh, Sinai experience. And then we're getting ready for a third section, which is the dealing with the tabernacle. Now, we'll never really finish the second section because we'll have parts that will, again, play out in, in, in the third. But technically, this is the end of that section. Now, remember, the, the, the Hebrew acronym for these first six is called Shovavim, which is the idea of irresponsible. In other words, oftentimes we become, we're irresponsible. We don't do as we know we should. And so he's talking to us in those kinds of terms. Mishpatim happens to be, well, mishpat is the word for ordinance. So we're going to study the ordinances, and there's probably 53 of them. And if I was a lawyer, I would get excited about this, but I'm not a lawyer, so I don't get real excited about studying these kinds of things, but I wanted to, I wanted you to feel comfortable. So I went and got off my shelf three books. Now, these three books are the, are the first three of the 10 books that are necessary for studying the civil laws and the laws of uh, criminal court. So there's 10 books altogether, but these three volumes together form a book which is called Netzin, uh, Netzkin, which is the word for damages. So we're, these three books only deal with the damage section. Then there's Sanhedrin, which 10 of the chapters deal with criminal law, and those are included there as a part of the overall thing. But there's lots of books, and I'll get into it, but these are the first three books that are in it. One's called uh, Bava Kama, then Bava Mitza, and then Bava Batra. One's the first gate, the middle gate, and the final gate. So basically, we're going to go into gates, walking through as you're looking at this. And if you want a shorter version of this, you go to chapter 21. Because basically, chapter 21, 22, and 23 deal with civil law. That's what you're basically dealing with on various levels of civil law. So I wanted to give you an understanding that, that, that this is what's going on here. In our last section, chapter 20, he came down from the mountain with what we would say were the Ten Commandments. As he comes off the mountain with the Ten Commandments, he immediately spins into Mispatim, and he begins to write or record for us these things. So I want you to look at 21.1 for a second. Not that we're going to stay long. But in 21.1, he begins with the word and, vav. Vav then is going to tie us back to the previous line, previous word, which was the dealing with the Ten Commandments. And so these are about these ordinances, and they relate to the Ten Commandments. Now, they don't relate to all of them in, in a direct way. We know that the first, the, the tablets were two tablets. Each one's about an 18 inch by 18 inch by six inch block that Moses was trying to carry down. The block is made out of sapphire. And so the first set of tablets God created for Adam or for Moses to bring down were made from sapphire stone. And so they were carved by God and written upon by God. Now the second set of tablets are gonna be carved out by Moses. Moses will find a bed of sapphire stone underneath his tent, and he will chisel out two pieces of sapphire, about 18 inches by 18 inches by six inches. That's the, the size of these tablets. Now imagine carrying that much down the hill, how much that, that stone actually is going to weigh. Just like the ark itself, the ark 
carried itself and so will the stones carry themselves because the stones themselves are become heavy it's the writing on the stone which lightens it in other words god is actually carrying the language to us or carrying it for us so that's the legal beginnings so as we get into the story then he's going to deal with ordinances now the 613 i have to have you know are the laws themselves but there's also what are called testimonies a yot, a dot. There's also what are called hoch, or decrees. Together, they make up the 613. Now, these first 53 probably were already spoken before they got to this point. Because we know at Mara, according to the, to the stories in the Midrash and, and the hints in the Bible, in Exodus 15, God had already begun to explain to Moses the laws that would become necessary. And if you go back, you'll find that those laws that he's beginning to discuss really flow out of the, out of the seven rules, the seven for the, the no hides. So we're going to get a lot of these laws that are here in Mishpatim apply to Gentiles just as much as they do to Jews. The seven are, are categories. They're not just simply one law, they're a category. Then there's going to be under that category, corollaries. Then under the corollaries, there's gonna be explanations. And that's what the testimonies are going to be about, explaining and giving us examples of how each of these fit together. Now there's some things that we are going to understand that have no comprehension, comprehensibility, and that's the ashes of the red heifer. That's the greatest of the hope. That's the greatest of those decrees. God has established it. We're going to carry it on. Well, that actually occurred back at Mara. Mara is where they began that whole process. They actually, at that point, when they established an altars, were, that's where this whole thing started. So the ashes of the red heifer are going to be already there prior to the giving of the, the Ten Commandments and Israel's falling into the hands of the golden calf. God will have already established a remedy to deal with the sin that they're going to have created. So that's a significant point that I think I want to make sure I bring across. Now, if I go back to, the, to these uh, gates for a second, and I want to give you some information I don't want to spend a long time there, but I just want you to understand the first gate deals with civil matters, Bava Kama. There's 10 of them, 10 areas that they focus on. Those areas are on things like uh, attacks by animals. What if you have a dog and your dog attacks your neighbor or your dog attacks your neighbor's dog? How do you deal with that whole idea of, of a vicious animal? How do you deal with the idea of causing somebody else damage? How does that work? How is it that you fail to, to keep something from happening? How are you responsible? And finally, fire. You know, fire is that one thing that you have the most difficulty controlling. Fire also consists of anger, issues of anger. All of that goes into the first set of, of these commands. The second set or the middle gate that you're going to look at, those are the civil matters. That's the torts. That's the, the lawsuits that come about. That's what's going to go on in that. Because there will be things that you will sue one another over. And those are handled in this court also. Now, the third area that you're going to have, oh, by the way, property also is in there. The third area that you're going to have, again, deals with property rights like moving stones. So in other words, your boundary line and his boundary line are blurred or about the idea of, of your relationship with your neighbors, the, the Hatfields and the McCoys. In other words, getting along. How does one do that idea of partnerships? In other words, as a partner, what is your responsibility? Do you write it out? This is what you're responsible for. This is what they're responsible for. In other words, it's contracts. 
that are going to go on. Then there's the idea of an inheritance. How does things get passed along? Again, the idea of a will, the idea of an understanding beforehand. And finally, the idea of charity. How does one go about giving charity? How does one express this idea? Not in the form of a tax form where you get money back from giving money to other people. But those are the basic areas in this one. Now, there's also, if you go to the Sanhedrin, you're talking about the rules of court. If you talk about uh, Makot, you're talking about lashes. In other words, you're being punished for what you're doing. How many lashes do you deserve? It also talks about the cities of refuge. That all fits under this whole idea. Then you have what's called uh, in Shavuot. It's not Shavuot, but Shavuot. You're dealing with the idea of oaths, oaths and consequences. Making an oath, what is the consequences of breaking the oath? Oaths and vows is what you would probably call it. Then you have what is called Edot, which is the idea of testimonies, the idea of case law. In other words, there are examples of this that are all going to be written for you. So if you can find a preceding law, just like at the Supreme Court, what laws are you quoting to defend your side of, the, of this argument? So that's what goes on there. We talk about Avodah Zarah, that's the idea of idolatry or foreign worship. But it also deals with interactions between Gentiles and Jews. That's covered in this whole section. Then you have what's called a vote, which is the idea of, it's a collection of sages sayings, uh, quotes, things that they found important that would fit into life's categories. And then the final one is called uh, Horayot, Horayat. And that's the idea of decisions. In other words, there's been major decisions in all kinds of areas that have been collected over time. So the Talmud is full of all of this information. And so here is Moses trying to give you the very first sets of explanations. And as we go through this list of explanations, some of the times you're just going to receive an ordinance. He's going to tell you what it's about. Other places, he's going to give you what we would call oral law or understanding of how that fits or how that works. And so all of these 53 then are going to have parts. Now he begins with the easy one because he says, if you buy a Jewish bondsman, create yourself a slave. Well, why is he going to bring that up first? Because that's what they were in the land. Now, what happens when you become wealthy enough that you have one? How do you, how do you treat that person? What are the values that are important in that case? So those are all going to be part of, of this first section of 53. So that's going to happen. I also want you to understand that in these 53, as you go through it, if you turn over to page, uh, well, you know, not a page, but in uh, Exodus 23, verse 14. Okay. Three pilgrimage pilgrimage festivals you shall celebrate for me during the year you shall observe the festivals of matzos and he goes on to the festival of harvest or first fruits and then he goes to the festival of in gathering well matzos pesach we already know that they've already identified that what you didn't know was that they have the first fruits which are again a autumn kind of a thing and again the last one is is in gatherings or Sukkot which is also so these this section here talks about something that really hasn't happened in other words it's it's out of time and out of place is what I'm trying to say but it's listed here and it is understood that these are laws that they're going to have to obey did Moses put it in here out of sequence or as they began to piece back together all of the laws. Oh yeah, I remember him talking to me about this because chronologically, this Bible doesn't work. It doesn't fit the way it's supposed to. And that's really a very big struggle. And by that, I want you to turn back to, to chapter 24 and that's where I wanna spend my time, okay? Hope you're ready. 24.1. To Moses, he said, go up to Hashem, you, Aaron, Nadab, and Avihu, 
and 70 elders of Israel, and you shall prostrate yourselves from a distance. To Moses, he said. Who said to Moses? God said to Moses. God is speaking. God is telling Moses, I want you to go and notice it's not in the first person, it's in second person, he's talking. And so he begins by saying, go up to Hashem, come see me. You, Aaron, Nadav, Avihu, and the 70 elders. Problem, he leaves two of Aaron's sons out. Why does he leave two of the sons out? Well, there's nobody who seems to have an answer for that question. But we do know that Nadav and Avihu become very significant in our stories because of their early death. And there's also going to be a throwback story that comes out of this whole thing. So anyway, these characters are supposed to go up and the first thing they're supposed to do is prostrate yourselves from a distance. And Moses alone shall approach Hashem, but they shall not approach and the people shall not go up with him. So in other words, we have this stoppage somewhere on the mountain. They prostrate themselves. Moses is to stand up and to move further up the mountain. Now, as we go through this story of moving up the mountain, he's going up there by himself. He's approaching without the people. Now, Moses came and told the people, time out. What are we missing? The event on the mountain. What was it that happened up there? It's not here in our story. Now, midrashically, there's lots of stories that have been used to explain what happened. It's understood that on Moses' trip up the mountain, that the angels were interfering with the trip. They didn't want them to receive the commandments. The angels thought the commandments were for them. Men, mankind, was, were, they were idiots. They couldn't keep the track of these laws if they don't wanted to. But then Moses said to them, why do you need them if you don't need them? Why do you want to keep them if they're not meant for you? And so they allow him to continue to go up. And then now the angels begin to give him gifts as he's going up the mountain. So he receives different gifts as he ascends the mountain. And he receives one gift from the angel of death. The angel of death tells him about the light of the Keteret the light of the, of the lamps, the light of, of the light for the menorah. Now, Keteret comes from Ketu, which is the idea of, it means to bond. So God, the angel of death, is beginning to tell Moses about the bonding between mankind and God, how it fits together, what it's supposed to look like, how one should act and react. Now, remember, the rest of the men are down on the side of the mountain. There's a story that when it was time for them to prostrate, 71 of them did. Moses went up, but two others were left standing. The two that didn't prostrate themselves were supposedly Nadav and Avihu. And then the question becomes, why didn't they? Which takes us back to the story in Genesis chapter four. Beginning in verse three. After a period of time, Cain brought an offering to Hashem of the fruits of the ground. And as for Abel, he also brought the firstlings of his flock from their choicest. Okay, so two offerings were made. The offering that came from Abel was the choicest. The offering that came from Cain was the first fruits. Hashem turned to Abel and to his offering. Okay. Who saw that? Who witnessed the receiving of the offering? But to, to Cain and to his offering, he did not turn. Now, we know that one of these two brothers actually has a relationship with God that is beyond normal. Literally, God will talk with Cain 
but he does not talk with Abel. Why doesn't he talk to Abel? Why does he talk to Cain? The understanding is that at this point in time when Cain, when Abel received his offering and his offering was accepted, he chose to stand and watch. And in watching, remember the name Abel, Havel, means vanity. Imagine how he accepted the fact that God accepted it. That's the concept of what's going on in Avihu and Adav's being, or at least that is the understanding for many of the rabbis, is the fact that they themselves found themselves better. Now, no one can look at God and live. What will happen to Abel as we leave this story? Abel will be killed later by Cain. What will happen to Nadav and Avihu later? Same effect. So the understanding is what, how one relates to God should be seen from the way we react in those special times. That's what's going on in the special times, okay? So I want you to go back to, the, to Exodus 24 again. And here again, as we're looking at this whole thing, we notice that all of a sudden, the, he goes down to the people. And uh, in verse, what, three, it says, Moses came and told the people all the words of Hashem and all the ordinances, and the entire people responded with one voice. And they said, all the words that Hashem has spoken, we will do. Okay, so what they're basically saying is all the words that Moses learned in 21, 22, and 23 is what Moses went and shared with them. Again, the idea is not all the commandments came at the point of lightning and thunder. That's the concept that's going on. And so they were able to hear Moses understanding that all these were the words of Hashem and all of these were laws, ordinances, things they needed to keep, mishpat. So therefore they all respond with one voice, all the words that Hashem has spoken, we will do. Now Moses wrote all the words of Hashem. He rose early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain and had 12 pillars and the 12 tribe for the 12 tribes of Israel. Now he sent the youths and, and the word here for youths is the word for na'arate, which is if you're interested, if you have your art, if you have an art scroll, it's easier for me to point it out to you. But if you're interested, it's in the line marked hey. Kaf dalit hey. And it's the fourth word in from the right hand side. It's a nun, an ein, a resh, and a yud. So this is the word for youth. A youth is one who is not of bar mitzvah age. In other words, he's less than 13 years of age, has not gone through bar mitzvah. He's still what we would call innocent. All of the things that he's done wrong do not reflect on him. They're not accepted as part of him. It is only after he becomes the son of the law that he now violates laws. So at this particular point, he is a young man, 12 years of age. So he sent the youth of the children of Israel and they brought up the burnt offerings and they slaughtered bulls of Hashem as feast, peace offerings to Hashem. Moses took half the blood and he placed it in basins and half the blood that he threw upon the altar that, that had been made that morning. And he took the book of the covenant and he read it in earshot of the people, and they said, everything that Hashem has said, we will do, and we will obey. See how it fits in with the, the previous sayings of what we're going to do will go on. But notice, again, back in four, Moses wrote all the words of Hashem, and he arose early in the morning. So his night using my sanctified imagination, his night was spent recording information. Now, 
as uh, Ross and I had been discussing earlier, Moses is not near a drugstore where he can get a new tablet of paper whenever he wishes. In fact, there was no drugstore anywhere nearby, nor was there any tablets of paper. So the question is, what is he writing all of this on? And as we go through, you've noticed we've had quite a bit of information that's been given to us at this particular point in time, and he's recording this. And he's recording it for what he calls the Book of the Covenant. The question then becomes, what's the Book of the Covenant? The rabbis would tell us the Book of the Covenant is the first five books of Torah. Now, is he writing down in this tent that night the first five books of Torah? Probably not, because he hasn't experienced all of those things yet. He's not auto writing, or at least I don't think he's auto writing. He also has probably got to figure out how am I going to record Genesis? Because that's going to be part of the, the structure of what I'm writing. Well, if you're now writing Genesis all the way to Exodus 23, how many drug stores would you have had to pass in order to be able to get all this done? Do you understand what I'm saying? So this book is partially being done now. It is not complete. In fact, if you, if you look at some Torah scrolls, you find that the scrolls are pieced together, stitched together. That's how what we're talking about is going to happen. In other words, as he creates his diary of the events and writes them down, they will be pieced together one upon the other. Now, we also have another problem. And it's a problem that I was talking with Ross about earlier. In fact, Ross meant brought it up first. Otherwise, I would have been able to take credit for it, but I couldn't. Now, the problem is, what language did Moses write it in? Everybody would say Hebrew. What's the problem with Hebrew? Hebrew, as we see on page 194 of our Bible, isn't the same Hebrew that Moses would have been able to write in. In other words, Moses came from a picture language nation. Joseph had begun to create the alphabet. I don't know if you knew that. Joseph was the one credited with creating the Hebrew alphabet. Joseph then began the processes of writing. That was in the Hebrew. They found some caves in, in the copper fields that had the same Joseph hieroglyphics. So that's when they began to understand how the language first appeared as pictures, not as letters. Now, I made your life totally miserable. And so let me finish this whole thought out. He's now writing down in this language that he has got that will later be translated in again. Each translation takes us farther away from the original, making it more difficult for us to, to imagine how it all fits together without having an oral story that carries it through and connects all of these stories to us and uses these same words because we're gonna find out over time as you go through the Bible that there are words that are archaic words that have only been used once in the entire Bible that probably were more common way back when, but now are just there. We're going to find out about the names of buildings and cities that are, that are no longer in existence when Moses wrote. So Moses used the name of a city that was in the, that particular point in time, and that's how it came to be. So we're going to have lots of variations of this. And so I, I want you to understand if you're really working at this, it's not that easy, but it's meant for us to, to search it, to, to reach through it, to dig it, and to go after it. That's what God wants us to do. Show yourself approved. And that proof is in, in your, your willingness to continue to dig, to talk with other people, to, to really search out what it really is saying because it's a very different book. When I listen to uh, Dave on, on Wednesday nights, he, 
as he goes through it, you can hear how some of the book has changed, how some of the stuff that was in it may not have ever been there, and how some of it had been ripped out and moved and put in some other places. But that is in order to make the story make more sense, although it would have made more sense to us if it was chronological. But then there would have had to have been a whole lot more backstory. And so that's what we're finding is there's a lot of backstory that's missing in our in what's going on. So he builds this 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 altar, okay? Now after having built the altar, there's animals that are going to be brought up. He's not bringing the animals up. The animals are being brought up by twelve year olds. Now why are the twelve years twelve year olds bringing up the animals? Because there's nobody righteous yet. There is no peasel. There is no Levitical tribe. There's Aaron, Nadav, and Avihu, and all those. They haven't been assigned that that role yet. Remember, it's not till the end of this of this book of Shemot that they're actually going to be assigned as the high priests and and literally given assignments. So it's the twelve year olds that are here. I remember in the days when I followed Vendel Jones, Vendel would oftentimes dig over and in, in looking for the ashes of the red heifer. And in his digging for the ashes of the red heifer, he'd always have a rabbi with him. And he also had 12-year-old boys with him. And the question I was often asked was, why did you bring those kids along? And he says, because it was it's inappropriate for anyone to touch the ashes of the red heifer who is not clean. And the only way one can be clean is to be younger than 12. That's the only way. You haven't sinned yet. Even the rabbis couldn't touch the uh, touch the kalil, the bowl in which the ashes have been kept. So whatever is going to happen, it's going to happen with young ones. And so the young ones are going to lay the, the offerings out on the altar. Not just randomly. I'm sure they're going to be given some basic instructions on how to do it. Now, as you go through this story then, so the children are brought, bringing these offerings up to the top. There are offerings that are burnt offerings. There's peace offerings. There's lots of different offerings. And according to one text, they also bring up the ashes of the red heifer. They bring up the red cow to lay on the altar so that it can be completely consumed and the ashes and the dung from that animal can build the first, first kalel that goes into it. Let me explain the Kalel again. You're going to see it in numbers, but I just want to give you an idea. The ashes of the red heifer is a hoke. It's a decree that God made. Now, this decree makes no sense because somebody who is sprayed with these ashes will become clean when they were unclean. And the one who sprinkles the ashes will become unclean, well, who was clean. So there's a process that goes on. Now, in the course of the slaughter of the first cow, the first cow, again, throat was slit in appropriate manner. I am assuming Moses was the one who did it because there was nobody that was identified or as qualified at that point in time. No shokut was created. He slits the throat of the animal. The blood is taken from the animal. The animal is laid on the altar, just like all the blood of the other two animals were also put into containers and that those containers were used for splattering the blood. Now, the red heifer, on the other hand, once his ashes were consumed, he was taken. And what they did was they took his dung, his leftovers, and they built a kalel, a jar, a container. Into the container, his ashes went. Those ashes were used for sprinkling and cleansing things all the way through the wilderness. Up until this point in time, my understanding is that they've had nine heifers that they've used for cleansing purposes. In the book of Ezekiel, it talks about the fact that the rivers will be sprinkled with the ashes of the red heifer and the waters will become clean. That whole concept is involved in, in what's happening here. So this is the beginning of an event by verse 6, it says, Moses takes half the blood and he placed it in basins, and half the blood he threw upon the altar. 
So blood was scattered, splattered upon this altar at this point in time. Then he took the book of the covenant and he read it in earshot of the people. And they said, everything Hashem has said, we will do and we will obey. Again, concept, book of a covenant hasn't been completed yet. What he's reading is, his, is the part that he has written down. And this is God's word that he's speaking to them. They accept this word as being the word that he has spoken at this point. So that's what they're going to obey. Now, if we go to the next verse, verse number, what, number nine. Moses, Aaron, Navid, Navad, Nab, Nabad, and Avihu, and the 70 elders of Israel ascend. Now, the 70 elders of Israel are 70 senior citizens. They're the, the wise men of the group. Doesn't mean that they've been established as the Sanhedrin yet. We're not sure who is in this 70 and who decided would be in the 70. Because remember later, there'll be 70 more that'll be selected and for, and what, 12 from, or yeah, no. 70 more will be selected, Nadab, um, Mendad, and uh, Eldad say they don't want to go. So that's how they not go. And there'll be only 70 left. And those 70 become the elders of the Sanhedrin. They're the first group. Well, actually, two of those that went will not be. And Medad and Eldad will be added to the group. And we'll go through that story when we get to numbers also. So I want you to understand that this is just a group of wise sages, wise men. And so they have gone with him and they saw God, saw the God of Israel and under his feet was the likeness of a sapphire brickwork. Did you hear? They saw God. Nobody sees God. What did they actually see? if they don't see God. Some people say they saw the legs of God sitting on his throne. Some simply say that they had an aberration in which they saw all the way into heaven. Now, th this sapphire stone that was beneath his feet, oftentimes as identified as, a, as the footstool. Whatever it was, it's from that that God is going to carve out the two tablets that he's going to hand out. And it was the essence, it was like the essence of the heaven in purity. So that's what he's using, the sapphire stone. And it came from a brick, the single block that he is going to split in half. Because originally the brick would have been 18 by 18 by 12. Now it's going to be 18 by 18 by uh, six. That's how it's, the blocks are going to be. So it gives us an interesting understanding about these blocks that are coming down. So as we go through the story, then notice what happens. So they saw the, the God of Israel and under his feet was the likeness of the sapphire. And it was the essence of the heaven in purity. Now against the great men of the children of Israel, he did not stretch out his hand. They gazed at God, and yet they ate and they drank. In other words, remind yourself, what's the penalty for seeing God? This is the one time when they were allowed to see God and weren't destroyed. In fact, they were so excited they weren't destroyed, they ate and drank together. And I think they would have probably drank more than they ate because that would have been an amazing event at that point in time, whatever that image of God was, because nobody can see God. Remember, even Moses could only see his backside. And that, even when he saw his backside, all he's looking at are his attributes. So it's, a, it's, an, it's an image that has no clarity to it, but they saw it. Now, Hashem spoke, said to Moses, Ascend to me to the mountain and remain there, and I shall give you the stone tablets and the teaching of the commandments that I have written to teach them. So in other words, this set of events probably occurs again prior to the giving of the, of the Torah or the giving at Mount Sinai 
matan uh, tablets. Those are that's the beginning of this. So he's going to ask him to come up again. Now Moses stood up with Joshua his servant, and Moses ascended the mountain of God. Notice different characters. To the elders he said, "Wait here, wait with uh, or wait for us here until we return to you." Behold, Aaron and her were with him with you. Whoever has a grievance should wait, approach them. So, in other words, he's establishing lines. Remember, nobody could go on the mountain. Now he's saying these men can go on the mountain, but they can go only to a certain place. Then there's another level where Joshua and Moses are below the line of the clouds. And Moses himself is going to be the only one who actually goes into the clouds. So there's a, a order by which they, they ascend. Now, at this particular point in time, Aaron and her are there to receive complaints. What kind of complaint would you have for standing on a mountain waiting to, to hear from God? Why does Joshua get to go up farther than I do? How's come we don't get to see what's going on? If one of the 70 happened to be Korok, could you imagine the contention that would have been right there with the 70? Anyway, so Moses ascended the mountain and in the cloud covered the mountain. The glory of Hashem rested upon Mount Sinai and the cloud covered it for six days or a six day period. Now he called to Moses on the seventh day from the midst of the cloud. The appearance of the glory of Hashem was like the consuming fire on the mountain. Now you're getting back to the 18 and 19 when we got those that picture of the fire and the smoke and all of the other things. So here's another conundrum that some people have. Notice he goes up for six days and now on the seventh day he approaches. So there's now a question among the Jews, was the day of the, of the actual collecting of the Ten Commandments on the sixth or the seventh? And I'm not gonna tell you the answer. I'll let you, folk, let you fumble through the Bible and come up with your own understanding. But that is a true question that's going on within the Jewish community. It's not something that they've already resolved. So anyway, the appearance of the glory of Hashem was like the consuming fire on the mountains and top before the eyes of the children of Israel. Moses arrived in the midst of the cloud and ascended the mountain. And Moses was on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. End of this story. End of the story. Because the next story we're going to get into is dealing with the fact of Moses coming down. And the idea of all of the things that are going to happen in regards to the to the understanding of the tabernacle. Okay. I've rambled for about 45 minutes. Anybody have anything they'd like to talk about? Feel free to do so now. I had a question. I don't think I understand. If the alphabet wasn't even created till Joseph, then well, that was created. What what language did God write on the tablets? Yes. Okay, that's a great understanding. <laughs> All right, understand. First off, the alphabet was created from the very beginning of time. The alphabet was used to build all, the, all of the world, everything that's in it. Now, that alphabet was simply spoken, remember, God spoke everything into being. There was no need for a written language at that point in time. Everything was spoken. Here at Sinai, we begin to understand that in the thunder, in the voices, they could see the words. This is the first time that language literally became something that was visible. But at the same point in time, the question has always been, what was it? What did the language look like? Again, the understanding is that there was a, a series of, of exchanges in language to finally reach the point of the language we have in our Bibles today. 
So that's the easiest way I can answer it. There is no, there is no easy answer. Sometimes when a rabbi is explaining it to his people, for example, the commandments were written on the stone and literally they were written on the front and the back of the stone. It went all the way through. Well, if you look at your modern alphabet, the Samic is nothing more than a hole. How would that Samic hold itself on the rock? How, how, would, how would you be able to see the outline of that? And if you were a final mem, the mem looks like a box. Again, giant hole. How does that look? So the assumption is that probably that's one way it could have happened because God just simply did it. And according to some stories, as they, as they were coming down the mountain and as Moses got closer and closer and he could hear what was going on, the letters of the, of the Ten Commandments began to fall off. And as they fell off, the stones became heavier. And that's really what caused Moses to drop the tablets. He couldn't carry them any longer. Others say, no, the tablets were fine. He threw them down so that they wouldn't have to deal with the marriage contract that he just assigned up at the top of the mountain. Lots of different ways. But I guess for the simplified answer of uh, what kind of language to use, the answer I can give you, the best answer I can give you is I haven't got the faintest clue. Because I was thinking of reverse engineering it. If the letter jumped off and fell on the ground, then pick them up and try to figure out what they were and create one. Oh my well, goodness. And again, we have to know that the, the commandments there supposedly were five on each tablet, right? Right. If you look at the tablets, then the first four on the tablet that he was carrying in his left arm would have been the commandments dealing with, I am the Lord thy God, I am one. They're, right. they're, all, spiritual, they're all spiritual commandments. Right. The fifth commandment was the commandment of honor your father and your mother that your days may be long. Well, that's added on. But father, honor your father and your mother. Well, if you go back to understanding from the very beginning, the father, the mother, and God are responsible for each individual. They, they work as a team. So the fifth commandment fits actually in the spiritual categories. The next five commandments are all physical ordinances. Those are the ones that we see in Mishpatina. That's what that... Basically. Right. People to people. People to people, that kind of thing. Well, it, and the other thing that came to my brain was if they didn't have a bunch of written things, how did they know the kosher way to slaughter? Was that just always handed down? It, it was handed down, but as far as always hand, handed down, laws were, were eventually recorded obviously somewhere along the line the first five books were all put together and, and that was supposedly what Moses handed to each of the 12 tribes he created I think it was 14 one for each of the tribes one that went into the tabernacle and one that he kept himself there were 14 so in other words they were all identical he wrote them all himself so, for example, if there came a question of, and he's not around, how would you know what he actually said? How would you can keep from making a mistake? You'd compare two of, the, two of the scrolls, two of the books. They're written identical. Having been written identical, what do you know? Therefore, that's how they would analyze it. Also, during the time that he was with them, everything isn't recorded in, in the what, five books. So what do we have to understand? We have to understand that there was a lot that was given orally. Remember how Moses continually passed out information. In a normal way, he gave it to Joshua, to Aaron, to his sons, to the rulers, the, the 70 and then to the people. So it was a continual passing it down. Not the easiest way to live or work, remember? Look what Adam did with, with the original commandments. This is why I want you to tell your wife, okay. And he tells his wife, what happened? 
not good. Not good. No, I mean, you, you read the end of the story, right? You, you, you learned where they got kicked out. Yep. So the concept is that there's a lot of things that we have going that are that are require us to really search out. And even today, filling in the gaps in our pages. Because I can tell you that I could have also just as easily told you this story and included Jethro's dinner with Moses and how Jethro was a part of this whole thing, even though Jethro is never mentioned here. But again, when Jethro has his meal with Moses, Moses' name doesn't appear. So was Jethro eating with Moses or was Jethro eating alone thinking he was with Moses? And was Moses alone thinking he was eating with Jethro? Whatever have you, you, you have these blanks that are not given answers to. And that's why we have so many denominations in this world. So many people having so many thoughts as to what the text actually says. And we're going to have that until finally we have what's called the Mashiach. Somebody who will sit down and straighten this out and help us get through this. But you can still learn as much as you can learn. That is the important thing. That's what God wants us to do. Study to show yourself approved. Simple Amen. class. Promise. I forgot it was I forgot it was being recorded or I wouldn't have asked. <laughs> Thank you. Well, no, actually, that's a good thing because if you don't ask, how do you know somebody else doesn't have the same question? I mean, I when was the last time you heard that topic of, of the alphabet? You've never heard it, not unless you were sitting in a special place. Unless you went through historically, I've gone way back and went through. I was in college taking a class in, in languages because I didn't want to take French. So I took a language course, basically telling me about the Indo-European languages, the Semitic languages and all of the other. And I began to understand there was no written language for the for the most part for Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. There's a Babylonian language. There was other languages, but there was no such thing as a Hebrew language written down. How did it come into being? Well, it, it, it was a gradual process. That's the hardest thing to understand. We think everything is perfectly clear, but it's not. That's, that's the, the struggle with, with learning. But I would rather struggle with knowing that I'm learning than to accept everything as an idiot and find out I screwed up and missed the boat. So we study, and you guys come to study with me. We've been doing this for, well, you and Bobby and, and Mary and I have been doing this for what? 16 years, 17 years, been to studying this together. Rob, he's... He's new. He and Peggy, they've, they've only been with me three, four weeks. It, 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 but at the same point in time, I've got to teach you something new. And I got to teach Rob something new. For Rob, everything's new. So it's a, it's a whole different story. For you guys, what would bring you back if I didn't give you something you hadn't thought about before? That's what a teacher is supposed to do. They're supposed to make you think. They're supposed to make you challenge, go deeper. That's what, that's what this is about. So now I've given my 20 minute presentation on why I am a teacher and you people are dumb students. You people have not been, never mind. Back to the story. That's not nice. My wife is sitting here listening to this whole, whole diatribe. Go ahead, Bobby. I've, um, it's been 20 years. 20 years? Because my Hamash, when I got my, I didn't have my Hamash when I came to the first Torah study groups, but when I did get my Hamash, I wrote the date down, and it was February of 2002. Oh and I've been wishing I had written the date in mine. Thank you, Bobby. I was thinking it was at least 20 years. Yep. So, Rob, just, just look what you got to look forward to, 20 years. Awesome. <laughs> Awesome. <laughs> and again, Peggy, you, you, you're all learning. And, and again, Ross knows all this stuff. I'm just teaching to him. I've got to give him something to think about. Otherwise, you know, Ross would just shrivel up and die. 
Actually, he has a lot that he buries in my head after we're done talking or before we're talking, because we've already had an hour conversation earlier today. And now we're doing it again. So, but anyway. Yes, and if we had been a fly on the wall and listened to your conversation, we would have heard this earlier. Uh, some of it, right, Ross? Some, some of, of it. it. Not all oh, of it. We can't tell it all because then, then what would you do for the next class? <laughs> Well, in a lot of things, you say, why would we come back? Because a lot of things we didn't maintain the first time or the 10th time or the 20th time, and we're still trying to get it. That's part, that's part of what we were talking about. Uh, you know, we, Steve and I both said the same thing. We studied something for 20 years, and then uh, day one on year 21, it's like, oh, the light just went on. Like some of the stuff I've read this week in the Zohar, it's like, uh, I think I've read more this week than in quite a while because they just can't put it down. It's just starting to click and come together. Well, and again, okay, today, my, my intent was to challenge your uh, wisdom, your insight, give you something new. That new insight, that new thought that you now have, my hope was that you would turn it into understanding. In other words, you would manipulate what you've just heard to fit with what you know. Now, having taken it from witness or from wisdom to understanding, now you take it and put it into knowledge that you can either emotionally share or intellectually share. In other words, last week, I think I was more emotional in my teaching. You know, I was trying to convince you I knew what I was talking about. This week, I wasn't attempting to convince you of anything. I was just attempting to give you something you hadn't thought about. That was an entirely different. That's what, that's what a teacher is supposed to do. They're supposed to cause you to do the thinking. That, that's what makes a good teacher. And remember, what we understand about Jewish teaching in order to, to there are three things that are necessary in order to teach you remember what they were student a teacher and uh, maybe that, uh... Torah <laughs> Torah <laughs> Torah <laughs> those are the three things you need you need to have somebody who's calling themselves the teacher now remember I am a limited teacher. By limited, that means I, I, I'm learning as you're learning. I am building my understandings and sharing them with you, hoping you challenge me. In other words, you begin to think for yourself, well, wait a second, does that make sense? Do you think that's right? In other words, you're challenging me, which forces me to, to go farther, to go deeper to come up with more rationale for why I said what I said, those kinds of things. But all of it has to be based on Torah, either in the written form or the oral, it has to be there. Because if it's not there, then you're building your house on sand, right? Mm -hmm. And we're trying to build our houses on something that is a firm foundation. So I promise not to try to send you into a a world that you don't need to be in, that you don't even want to be in. I want you to learn something that you can really hold on to and grasp and then force yourself to go deeper into the texts because that's that's the exciting part. You know, I've got three books going all at the same time. Like, you know, my, my mind, I turn on the idiot box because I need something to change my brain because I, that, that, Otherwise, I, I burn myself out thinking about different things. Give your brain a break. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, and it's not a good thing, but my mind, okay, you were in my classes before. How many new th things can an adult learn? Three or seven. 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 
Seven is the most I'm things really you could learn in one setting. Did I give you seven new thoughts? I think so. In other <laughs> words, when you go back and, and, and think about what you've learned, my wife asks me every time we sit down, well, what'd you learn? Yes. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? My mind is full of things. What did you learn? I hadn't sorted it out yet or put it into place. Today, when I, it was like uh, 12 o'clock, I think, I, or 11 o'clock, I texted Ross talking and asking, can, are you going to be able to open up the room for me? And he said, yeah. And I said, well, I'm having some discussions with myself, basically talking to myself. So we got on at about 11.30 and we talked for an hour. I got off, got cleaned up, thought about it some more, called him back again. We got on two o'clock, started going through it again, this time different material. But the understanding is it's, it's flowing out. In other words, I'm solidifying answers. In, in reality, this is called random digression. I have an understanding of what I want to teach. Then I have to go through, how am I going to teach it? Then what is going to be the highlight of those particular sections that I'm going to teach? That's, that's really what the art of teaching is about. And it, for you who have been with me for 20 some years, you need something new. For Rob, everything I'm telling him is new. So he, he's got to build on what he already knew before he came. And so does Peggy. And in some sense, so does Lori. Have to build on that. I've been with Ross, on the other hand, been. has been studying probably longer than I have. Oh, yeah. And so as we go back and start talking about things, there's a, a whole give and take in a different context. So, but again, three things you need teacher, a student, and a Torah. That's what you need in order to get started. I'm afraid to let my mind wander. I'm scared it won't come back. <laughs> <laughs> when you said your answer to Donna, it reminded me that so many times someone has had to miss a class and they'll say, well, what do you teach? And I'm like, uh... You should have been there. You, you had to be there to, to get it. Because the mind is so full. Yeah. Mary. And I was going to say to you guys, you guys got the principal. Rob and I got the teacher. Woohoo! Na 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 na. I did like something else that we read this week because. Um, we all know that back in the church, they didn't accept anything but the written word. And right here in verse 12 of chapter 24, it says, he gave him the stone tablets and the teaching and the commandments. So right there, you know, we the glossed story. over it when we were in the, the C building. Oh, there's, we gloss over it without being in the C building. <laughs> there are just new things. Like, for example, the idea, he's inserted in here, the feast of in, of in gathering that hadn't even occurred yet. And that's on the list of things that, that it, as a, one of the laws that they're supposed to keep track of. Can you imagine the people all of a sudden say, well, what the heck is that? Or yeah, we do it that. wasn't yeah. there, and in recollection, it was included. Because Moses may not have written it all down that, at that time, at that moment, because he didn't have a sheet of white paper and a pen. And that's the hardest thing to grasp. That's the hardest thing to grasp, is the fact that we're, we're, we have our minds built on what we think it would have looked like back then. Minus a target where they could go stop to get the paper and pens that he needed on the way through. That is that is the hardest part for, for me to get is what actually would he have known at that point in time. Not later, but at that point in time. 
And if you're talking about it later, what are you going to add to the story? In other words, what else has happened since then that fit with that story? And that's what the extra books of the laws are about. That's what the Sanhedrin is about. That's what Avot is about. It's about the adding of the ideas and extras. Because these three books, that's the law. That's it. Now, take those three books, and you add seven more to it, and those seven are more explanations about what happened in these three. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, uh, Steve, go up the mountain and get those for us, and <laughs> are, those readers digest for you. Yeah. Are, are those three books part of the Talmud set? Yes. You oh. have because I have I have three of them that are called the same thing as what you're saying. Yes. Okay. That's that's, that's three that you've got. Right. You yes. Also have, you have seven other books that go along with these three books. If you want to look about idolatry and how one treats another using understanding God, you go to Avot uh, Avodah Zarah. If you want to understand. Uh, criminal law, you go to Sanhedrin. If you want, you understand what I'm saying? They all fit off of these three books. But then again, they're appendages. That's why when a rabbi starts teaching, and this is what I find fascinating, when a rabbi starts teaching, he starts with one page out of this book. And he has to learn it so well that it can apply to other places. Now imagine learning these three books and applying it to seven more books and learning that and applying it to other things. And if I was a farmer, I would have us books on seeds. And those would be the first five books of the Talmud. You understand what I'm saying? It is so complex. And it's, it's the building of Isaiah. Here little, there little, the word of God is built. Line upon line. Precept upon precept. Go ahead, Ross. But just briefly, you're making it sound like you got three books. Here's the contract, and these other seven are the fine print. Yeah, well, these are even the fine print of the fine print. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was just using that as an analogy. But that, if you're looking at Mishpatim and you're looking at chapters 21, 22, and 23, they're all in these three books. Okay, those laws, those 53 laws. Now, understand, yes, I have one side is in Hebrew and one side to me. But imagine how many pages are devoted to each one of those 53 thoughts. You understand what I'm saying? That's why I brought the books off the shelf, just to give you an idea of just how much goes into how far... Can you understand why it's only a lawyer who would enjoy this? Wow. It's, it's the lawyer that enjoys this because he enjoys the minutia of, uh, you know, the idea of moving stones, the idea of how does one find out? I found something on my property that really belonged on my neighbor's property. I claimed it for myself. No, you can't. That's mine. Well, it's on my property. What are the rules deciding on whose that really belongs to? What do you have to understand? There's a whole series of events that help tie that together to let you know. But it's not a law. It's a, it's a corollary. It's a principle that helps you understand these 613 laws. But if you really wanted to go back and blow it up, there are seven basic laws. Everything fits under those seven categories. If it's got any importance, and significance, and value, go to the seven laws. Those are where you're gonna go. Because you see, when uh, when we read about the story of, of Moses on the mountain receiving the word of God, we heard about all the Jews that were down there listening. We never heard one word about all the Gentiles that were down at the bottom of the mountain listening and not only that they say that the word of god not only was heard by everybody there but is heard by everybody across the world 
well, why would we all want to hear about the laws of belonging to the Jews? Unless what we're really listening to is how it impacts each and every one of us. That's what we're really listening to, is these laws all fit together in a very nice way, but they all belong to us. Now, I can't tell you that I'm going to have to worry about the laws of, of the woman. I don't have a menstrual cycle. I've never had one. Wouldn't know what to do with it if I had it. I'm not a, a, I'm not a farmer, so there's going to be some seed laws that I don't have to really honor. But if I'm looking at the basics crux, what is it that I really need to know? They're all found in the 613. They all fit to me. And they fit to the, to the Jewish people too. I may not be as important as I think I am, but I'm more important than they think I am. At least that's what I think. So therefore, that's, a, that's, a, that's a rambling. <laughs>